so a lot of people say Sherlock of Years, so and um, like, what was your interpretation when you came to the role? Oh, and this character also does sing opera. Like, well, wow. this, to me, this version of Sherlock Holmes was internally the same person, the same character. I mean, one of the great things about Holmes is that he's an amazing detective, not the best guy. <laughs> so for them to build this world where he is actually the villain, you know, it didn't require any real change. You know, it's not like, hello, I'm good, Sherlock, and I'm bad, Sherlock. <laughs> no, I'm still the same person. This now my arrogance is used in a different yeah. way. <laughs> Mrs. Hudson, bring me, you know, yeah. he's, he's got that sort of, you know, elevated thing. But to me, in this story, we just find out more what's underneath that, but the personality on top is still the same. So Sherlock Holmes is a character who's been around for over 100 years. He's been on books and TV shows and movies. How big of a fan were you, uh, a Sherlock Holmes fan, before this project? And when you got that, when you were pitched, like, you get to be playing Sherlock Holmes, what was your reaction when you saw the twist of where this might be a different version of Holmes than we're used to seeing, and what, what was your initial reaction when you heard that twist? Well, no, I'm a huge Sherlock Holmes fan. I have the entire collection of the Conan Doyle books. You know, they're so still much. sitting on my shelf from you know so my preteen years. So being able to you know get a chance yeah. to bring this character well, to life so much of, was amazing. It was such a gift, happened, such like, a joy. Right? I mean, um, you know, there are iconic I, characters, Batman, you know, know but the chance to actually play something that's show, right? foundational to you know just my upbringing was amazing and the best thing about it though was the fact that they had a great script with this iconic character and the the twist was interesting because that made me question at first like okay so wait what are you doing but then i found that their approach to it was like we were saying before not like oh we're gonna you know make him evil Sherlock <laughs> they everything in this version of the um, <laughs> Sherlock Holmes and Moriarty so is rooted in the classic world and it and you're you know as you go along the series you'll find things like oh wait that's in the original book but now they put a different subtext beneath it and that was wonderful I mean that was such a joy it's like being able to play Hamlet but with a different story underneath. I guess if I had you know, that's, that's an actor's dream. Mm -hmm. So we were told you and Dominic recorded together, correct? <laughs> that is not correct. Dominic and Billy recorded oh, together. Oh, excuse me. Okay, all right. Then let me change my question around. So um, radio play itself is, is a very old format, right? Um, but this is something that's this is a very new approach. I think Audible hasn't done a ton of these. Videos. What would you say to people who maybe never experienced a radio play like this before to kind of bring them into the genre? And I, well, I think um, really it's interesting to to because the oddest thing about this format that that is the labeling. Mm -hmm. Is it a radio play? Um, is it a podcast? I, yeah. Is it an audio drama? Is it, well, you know, <laughs> everybody's using all these different terms and they all have slightly different associations, but they mean the same thing. You're listening to, you know, a story with just your ears. Um, and at least from a performance standpoint, there's nothing different about it. It's the same effort that you put on camera, except you don't have to, I don't have to wear the hat and hold the pipe, you know. Um, but I think for, I mean, for people nowadays, the reason we're going back to a format that, like you said, was, you know, people used to sit around in the 20s around the radio and listen to stories. Now, I'm walking around with my AirPods for 15 hours. So, 
in between rap songs, I'm going to listen to a Sherlock Holmes story. You know, yeah. it's it's wild that we now live in a culture where people listen to things for extended periods of time, whereas you know, in the area in the time between the 30s and now, didn't. You know, so I want to watch things. Like, well, there's so many ways to tell stories. You can read stories, you can watch stories, or you can hear stories. And the good ones make you feel the same way, however it's coming into you. As a prolific voice actor, you've done so many characters who all sound so different from each other. How do you approach developing the voice for a new character, especially when it's someone so iconic? Well, um, it's interesting. Uh, my friend D. Bradley Baker is a voice actor. He says, you know, you've got your, you know, bag of tricks. You know, you know, and I realized, you know, a few years into my voice acting, career, it's like, oh, it's not about everything has to be completely different. It's like, it's always going to be me. You know, it's the same thing with on camera acting. It's like, I'm gonna put a fake nose on for this one and a wig for, it's like, sometimes you do that, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you just play that version of the character as you, if you were, you know, the lawyer or whatever. In this, obviously, this character is coming from a very different world than me. He's in 1800s London. So I have to create a voice that sounds like an upper class Englishman in the 1800s, who is also incredibly intelligent and very influential and powerful. So we apply, I, I take those elements and figure out what voice you know, brings that character to life. And it would be the same thing if it's like, okay, well, here's a seven foot tall, red, weird, uh, you know, imaginary friend. You take the elements, you know, that the writers give you about the character and then you figure out a voice that sends those to the audience. Did you take something from your personal childhood memories of Sherlock Holmes and wonder, like, when you were reading what Sherlock Holmes would have sounded like? Well, and did you add your own personal, that's how I imagined him, so that's what I'm going to do? Yes, there's definitely a big part of that because, you know, when you read books, you hear the dialogue in your head, just not out loud. So, I mean, that was actually part of the, the wonder of this is like, oh, now I can finally hear those books I read, you know, 40 years ago. Um, although, you know, as someone else mentioned, there have been a lot of versions of Sherlock Holmes. And certainly for me, the Basil Rathbone version was sort of cemented in, because I'd seen that at the time that I was reading those books. It's like, okay, well, now I'm approaching this differently. I'm not just watching it. I'm reading this story. It's like, okay, well, I feel like Basil Rathbone, you know, physically looked and sounded like that character. But, you know, I think there may be a little bit of that in my version, okay. you know, as opposed to me putting his you know, voice down here. No, I felt that, because in my image of Holmes, there is a length to him. You know, the long face, you know, that, but we're not giving you as the audience a visual to the character, but I will make a decision as the actor about how this man's face might be shaped and come up with a voice that to me projects this sort of image. Now, if they came and said, oh no, we're gonna write, it's like, it's gonna be, it's got a big, heavy, grizzly Adam's beard. It's like, well, then that would be a different Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> if we were to record you in the recording, like video in the recording booth, are you doing that kind of thing, standing up straighter, holding your face differently to help with, like, manifest those choices into your voice, even though no one will see it? Mm, not so much. I mean, usually what you do is you you work and you work with the uh, the creators to find the voice like okay you know it's like well give them a little more um, upper class it's like, okay per and then once you find it then you no longer I mean especially with a voice like this where there isn't some oddness you know to it you know I don't have to stretch myself to 
And to do this voice requires no <laughs> physical changing. No, um, it's just mental changing. What is your favorite thing about Sherlock in general, but also this version of the about Sherlock? Well, my favorite thing about Sherlock Holmes is he represents the value of intelligence. You know, and this is, you know, we get justice by someone being so intelligent that they see a clue in anything, you know, and I think, you know, just in general, that's part of the wonder of the character, you know, um, Lindsay referred to me, he was like a superhero, it's like, well, sort of, except that it's not a superpower, it's just the height of human power. Which, you know, it's also what I loved about Batman. Really nice about it's not, not something, you know, from radiation from, or, you know, from an alien. Also, like, as a reader, He's one of us, I love the idea that you but doing it better <laughs> than all the rest of us. <laughs> it's like, okay, if I worked out or if I paid, you know, so much attention to every element around me, I would be Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> To go back to the Basil Rathbone reference, and then you've mentioned Hamlet and Batman, other two other examples, where you're playing a character that's been in the culture, and a lot of different interpretations of that character. And I was wondering, as a fan, which you said you're a big Sherlock Holmes fan, is there a danger in that? In that you catch yourself, whoa, I'm tilting too far into Jeremy Brett or Basil, Basil Rathbone. I'm channeling someone else when I need to find my own version. Well, yes, that could definitely be a problem if you're a fan of a particular performance. But if you're a fan of the character, that's a different thing. You know, I always joke to people that, you know, when we talk about taking over iconic characters from someone else, it's like, well, on stage as a stage actor, when you get cast as, you know, King Lear, you're not, oh, I gotta go find an old tape of Laurence Olivier and copy that. <laughs> no. You read the play and you play the character. Same thing here. You know, regardless of how iconic it is, I mean, the only time you would have a problem is if you were stuck in like a fandom, oh, I watched this when I was 13 and I loved it. I mean, like, you know, I also, Another set of books I own are the Conan the Barbarian books. I don't hear Arnold's name, <laughs> Arnold's voice when I when I read those. But I can imagine somebody now, if they get cast as Conan, like, get the Austrian's accent out of your head. <laughs> Could be a problem. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.